Well, good evening. This is Libertas. I've been away for a while, but I'm back again. And tomorrow is Memorial Day 2022. We, in our culture today, we look very rarely back past um, World War II and our, our veterans from World War II that we memorialize on Memorial Day. But Memorial Day is for all great Americans since the beginning of time. And America began on April 19th of 1775, according to the official records of the time. Legally, um, 4th of July is 76 is when we declared our independence. But April 19th was the pivot point in history where the American people stood up to the British Army, took a volley in the back, and then beat the snot out of the um, British Army and chased them all the way back to Boston. And they never really got outside of the city of Boston after that day. Um, Bunker Hill was basically a suburb of Boston and Charlestown, um, but that was, um, they occupied Charlestown at the end of that day, so they never took any more territory after that day of April 19th. So we're going to look at um, the soldiers that participated on that day. We're going to talk about the militia and the Second Amendment, and why all of these things are important to us today as Americans. We know in the last week there was a major shooting at a school, and as our wonderful, illustrious statesman in Washington, D.C., you never let a good crisis go to waste, so the Democrats and the Republicans are both saying we've got to do something about guns. Well, I'm going to show you what the um, Constitution says about guns, how simple it is, and how important it is for an armed citizen, citizenry. So with that in mind, I'm going to start here and share screen. And we are going to open this with this right here. This is the Holy Bible. This is the book of Numbers. Well, Libertas, what has this got to do with the militia? Well, this is where they got the militia, the idea of a, a militia. And this is so foreign to our way of thinking, and I understand, but I'm after truth. I'm a constitutional historian. I'm an award-winning constitutional historian. So if I say something, it's not my private interpretation. I just present the truth and the facts from the original records of America. And I'm gonna be showing you the actual original records of America. But Numbers chapter one talks about um, the militia, numbers of what? What were they numbering? So, and the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the temple of the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt saying, you know, they've been out here for two years now. And God tells Moses, take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the houses, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies." The key thing here is every male is to be enrolled this able. That's where we get, this is where we get the phrase able-bodied man. Every able-bodied man is right here. Every male 
by their polls from 20 years old and upwards that are able to go forth to war. So if you're crippled or lame or blind or um, some other physical problem then you, or too old or too young, then you're exempted from military service. This is not talking about a standing army. This is not talking about the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines that um, are full-time active duty things. These are every male, everybody, every single male. At the time of the American Revolution, the militia requirements were, was between 16 and 60. Every able-bodied man between 16 and 60 were required to enroll in the militia. There were different aspects of the militia. You had the exempts, which would be um, people younger than 16 and older than 60. A lot of them, you know, 50, 45 and older um, could be probably for the exempts. And then you would have what was called the militia which would be um, similar to the regular British army. These would be the guys that would march in order by companies and they would line up by companies and fire by company. And then you had the Minutemen. The Minutemen would be the special forces. They would, be, they would act as flankers and scouts and um, a rapid deployment force which we have today in our regular armies. But any, everybody between 16 and 60 was, was required to fight. They were required to protect their families. And another verse, it says to protect your wives, your families, and the cities of your God. Now we're going to look over here at Webster's. If you want to know the definition of American terminology, you have to go to this book here. This is Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the English Language. If you see the title up here, it says American Dictionary of the English Language. And if you look up here in the corner, you see another book, an old worn out book. This right here, my friends, is a Geneva Bible. Could possibly be the New Testament or the um, King James, because that's what he quotes here. But it was the Geneva Bible that the pilgrims brought over here and that the early Americans used. By the time of the revolution, however, the only book that they were, Bible that they were authorized to read in America was the King James, and just about everybody had a copy. So anyway, so if you want to know the proper American definition of a militia, this is it. Remember what we saw in the book of Numbers. Why is that important? Well, it shows you right here. Here's the dictionary of the American language, and here is the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible is used to describe the usage of American language. We're not going to get into um, any of those definitions right here, but this is a this is free on the internet and it's free app on your phone. It's a great great source. I, I highly recommend you get it. So here's a here's what a militia is, and it's not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. This is the definition of the American language, not what it means to anybody else in the world what it means to America. The body of soldiers in a state enrolled for discipline, but not engaged in actual service, except in emergencies. As distinguished from regular troops whose sole occupation is war or military service. The militia of a country are the able-bodied men. See, where did they get it from? The book of Numbers. Quoting the scriptures here. The militia of a country are the able-bodied men. Which ones? All of them. 
the able-bodied men of a country without distinction, all of them, and required by law to attend military exercises on certain days only, but at other times left to pursue their usual occupations. You are, um, so everybody is supposed to be armed and trained in the art of war. Every able-bodied man. If you think about it in commonsensical terms, a, um, if there's a riot in the streets and you had to call up the National Guard, it's going to take them a lot longer to mobilize and get there when you can just ring a signal bell from a church and have every able-bodied man within the distance of that church show up with their weapons to stop that riot. And that's exactly what they did. So, but here's another thing. It says that we, the, um, let's just read it. We'll go here. Now, this, this source here is Joseph Story's Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States in 1833. Up until this point, our legal system was based on this book here which is Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England. And this was the official legal text of America, American law and courts up until 1833, when America put together its own commentaries on the Constitution of the United States. The beauty of this document is here, once again, this is on the internet, it's free, it's searchable, it's clickable, but you see here all the footnotes where it takes you to both sides of the argument, the both sides of the debate of how they came up with the wording of the present document. So the next amendment, which is the second, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So what is a militia for? It's necessary to the security of a free state. Now, let me read that again. A well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. I don't know about you, but I'm not in a militia company. And I don't think anybody else in here is in a militia company. Might be a bunch of people going out together and shooting guns and calling themselves as a militia unit, which I used to do here in my county. But it wasn't organized by the government. Our officers weren't selected by the governor and the legislature. We weren't armed and trained by our government. So a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. A standing army, a great navy, a great air force, a great marine corps. No, it's the militia is what's constitutionally necessary to the security of a free state. Because if somebody, I live on the beach. If somebody's going to try to come onto my beach, then my town would be the first line of defense before everybody else could get mobilized, we could already be fighting. Anyway, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The right of the people. We're gonna look at three words here. Right, arms, and infringed. Most people don't know what this means. So we're going to go back over here to the dictionary and we're going to look up the word right, R-I-G-H-T. Talking about geometry in a straight line. Number two, in morals and religion, just, equitable, according to the standard of truth and justice or the will of God. That alone is right in the sight of God, which is consonant to his will or law. This being the only perfect standard of truth and justice. 
in social and political affairs, we're talking about a militia that is right, which is consonant to the laws and customs of a country, provided these laws and customs are not repugnant to the laws of God. A man's intentions may be right through his, though his actions may be wrong in consequence of a defect in judgment. It's very, very simple here, folks. I just showed you the source of the legal constitutional source of the Second Amendment, which is from the Holy Bible, which once again, you have the, the, the Constitution or the dictionary here defined by its biblical usage. I showed you that a militia was ordained by God with Moses in the children of Israel in the desert, every able-bodied man. And so we see it here that if it's a, we're looking at a right, if it's right, if it's a right, then it has to be right in the sight of God and his will and law in order for it to be legal, order for it to be a right. If, if, if my uh, memory fails me, you can remind me, but in my recollection, the Declaration of Independence says that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And unalienable means that they belong to that person and no other person can take, take them away from you for any reason whatsoever without your consent. We'll look at that word, I guess. But is a right which is consonant to the laws and customs of a country which the laws and custom of our country until only recent years was that every able-bodied man, man served in the militia from 16 to 60. In the current constitution of the state of Mississippi, it is 18 to 48, current constitution. Every able-bodied man in the state of Mississippi between 18 and 48 is to be enrolled in their local militia. So we said we were gonna look at a right and arms. Let's look at arms. Weapons of offense or armor for defense and the protection of the body. In, in, in legal sense, it says down here, arms are, any, are anything which a man takes in his hand in anger to strike or assault another. But arms, in the definition of what we're talking about here in military service, are weapons of offense. People are telling us all day long that we don't need military-grade weapons. You don't need an AR-15 to hunt a deer. Well, AR-15s were designed for deer hunting originally. They just found it was such a good, reliable weapon that they decided to use it for military purposes. So, and arms, keep and bear arms, it says right here, are weapons of offense. Look at it, folks offensive weapons or defense and protection of the body or armor, you know, body armor. So they're telling us that citizens don't need body armor. They're telling us that we can't have certain weapons because they're military grade. Well, of course they're military grade. You can kill somebody just as dead with, dead with a 22 as you can with a um, 50 caliber. It doesn't matter what the weapon is. It says down here legally is anything you take in your hand to assault somebody else. So keep that in mind. 
keep and bear arms, arms are weapons of offense or defense in the protection of the body. Okay. So that should clear up this whole discussion about what everybody's saying about we got to do something about guns. We got to do about something guns. You know, we got to defend ourselves. Well, if you take the guns away from people, they can't defend themselves. They can't defend their towns. Numb nuts. Anyway, infringed is the coup de gras. Infringe is to break as contracts to violate either positively by contravention, which is ignoring it, or negatively by non-fulfillment or neglect of performance, which is more of what we see today. A prince or a private person infringes an agreement or covenant by neglecting to perform its conditions, as well as by doing what is stipulated not to be done. So let's go back here again and let's look at what the amendment says. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Every man in a society is to be armed for the security of a free state. They're talking about security in a school. They're talking about security in this and the government has to do it. The government has to do it. It's not the government's responsibility. It's the government's responsibility to have a well-regulated militia. The right, the God-given right, folks, remember what I just read? Declaration of Independence says that our rights come from God. We just looked at the American definition of the word right. It's right if it lines up with the will of God. Where do you find the will of God? In the Holy Bible. Remember the title of the page? I don't, I'm not smart enough to make this stuff up. And I keep repeating this over and over like John Hannity. So it gets through your mind the importance of what we're facing here. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that word infringed, it is an unbreakable contract. Let's go back and look at that definition again on infringed. To infringe something is to break the contract, to violate the contract. See, our contract is the Constitution of the United States. The Bill of Rights is a separate document that's added to the Constitution. The first 10 amendments are the Bill of Rights. They are not ordinary amendments. We're going to look at that next. But here, you can't break. This is a contract that can't be broken or violated. Either positively by contravention, which is what they're doing now. They're trying to take away certain guns that they, our government, deems we don't need because they are considered military grade or offensive weapons. or negatively by non-fulfillment of neglect of performance. What they're neglecting to perform is the establishment of militia companies. Follow me? We're gonna look up unalienable. Not alienable. That cannot be alienated that may not be transferred as unalienable rights. This is something that can't be transferred. It belongs to you and me by the command of God, and it's also by the Bill of Rights. So with that segue, I'm going to pull out my little pocket constitution, if I can find it. Seems like I always have them sitting everywhere but where I need it and when I need it. Okay, 
let's just um, pause for a second. And I'll be right back with my little pocket constitution. Here we go. If you if you look at this little pocket constitution here. You would think everybody in America would know the legal definition of a Bill of Rights. But what happens is people got people have these by the millions. You know, I, I get boxes and boxes of them. I give away hundreds and hundreds of them a year. So, but you go through it and you get to the end of the Constitution here, and these are all the guys that signed it, and that's so nice and wonderful. And then it talks about um, this is done by the unanimous order of the convention signed by George Washington. And so um, no, September 17th of 1787. So, but you get to the next thing and you see the amendments. But what people fail to do is read the first page before that. It's called the preamble to the Bill of Rights. So it even says down here on September 25th of 1789, Congress transmitted to the state legislatures 12 proposed amendments, two of which having to do with congressional representation and congressional pay were not adopted. The remaining 10 amendments became the Bill of Rights. So the first 10 amendments are unique amendments. They are Bill of Rights. The uh, Constitution would not have been ratified had there not been a Bill of Rights because there was a majority of states that said, we will not sign on to this without a guarantee of a Bill of Rights. So they submitted a number of things that they wanted in a Bill of Rights, the state conventions, ratifying conventions did. And then George Washington made sure that the first order of business when they started the government in 89 was to institute the Bill of Rights that they sent out to be ratified. So this is the preamble to that, and it tells you what it's for. This is the legal definition of a Bill of Rights. So don't fuss at me because I know how to read. The conventions of a number of the states having at the time of their adopting the Constitution expressed a desire. Here's the thing. Here's the, here's the definition of a Bill of Rights. So pay attention in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of powers that further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added. And as extending the ground of public confidence in the government will best ensure the beneficent ends of this institution. It's to further prevent misconstruction and abuse of power of the government. Their de declaratory and restrictive clauses. Declaratory means declared. We declare that this is a restrictive clause. Now, who instituted this? The people, we the people. We tell the government this is off limits to you in every way, shape, or form. You cannot go here. You cannot legislate here. Huh. If this is declared and restrictive to the government for this express purpose to prevent misconstruction and abuse of powers, 
what is our what is our legislators doing this very day with debating and compromising on how to restrict restrict the guns of the people when it's off limits to them let me let me tell you that again it's unalienable it may not be transferred as unalienable rights they can't the, the, these are the rights of the individual citizen they cannot be transferred to somebody else they cannot be forced to be alienated meaning separated from us they belong to us and us alone we declare to the government you cannot touch anything to do with offensive weapons of war in the hands of the people. And you're supposed to have a well-regulated militia of every able-bodied man. Look at the violations of something so simple that's expressly said to be necessary for the security of a free state. Man, oh man. Let's go back over here. The next amendment, the second amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people. This is an unalienable, God-given, God-commanded, and God-sanctioned right of the people. It is a right that cannot be transferred or alienated from the people. And that right is to keep, own it, bear it, carry it, and use it for offensive purposes. So not be infringed. If you're in a firefight, you want to be the best armed person in that fight. Okay, now, this is the Supreme Court of the United States of America in the official constitutional textbook of American jurisprudence and constitutional law. This is the precedent cited by the Supreme Court. So anything that contradicts this, see, I, I, let me backtrack here. A judge never, 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 never sets precedent. George Washington set the precedent. He's the greatest man that ever lived. We have numb nut judges that think they're smarter than the guys that gave us the Constitution. And they put their hand on a what? Uh, holy Bible and swore to defend what the founding fathers of America did to protect it and to keep it and defend it, not improvise, not in, without the consent of the people, which is an amendment. And there's only been, I think, 23 of them. And the first 10 of them are untouchable to the government. Can't even talk about it over a cup of coffee at Starbucks. I keep repeating this over and over and over. Okay. The importance of this article, this, the Second Amendment, will scarcely be doubted by any persons who have duly, reflect, duly reflected on the subject. Think about it. They don't think about anything. They just react. The militia is the natural defense of a free country against sudden foreign invasions. The border? insurrections, domestic usurpata usurpations of power by rulers, violating their oath of office to protect our right to keep and bear arms, domestic insurrections are riots in the streets. It's the militia's responsibility, not the standing army or the National Guard. It's the people that can go to their closet, 
grab their rifle, go a few blocks to their city center and muster up. But here's the thing. It's the defense of a free country against domestic usurpations of power by rulers. That's why our government's scared for us to have guns. And we'll see as it keeps going. It is against sound policy for a free people to keep up large military establishments and standing armies in time of peace, both from the enormous expenses with which they are attended and the facile means which they afford to ambitious and unprincipled rulers to subvert the government or trample upon the rights of the people. Standing armies are danger to the people. What did the National Guard do after, um, what was it, um, January 6th, uh, 2020, or 2021, whenever that inauguration thing was, I guess 2021, they brought in the National Guard and they fenced off the people's house. You mm -hmm. can't even go visit your congressman. They had armed guards. The army was protecting the house of the people from the people. Would that be of um, unprincipled rulers subverting the government, trampling upon the rights of the people? Coming after the Second Amendment with legislative provisions, would that not be trampling upon the rights of the people? That is a God-given and unalienable, cannot be transferred or taken away by any other means other than killing you and taking it from your dead body. The right of the citizens, the right of the citizens, the right of the citizen to keep and bear arms has justly been considered as the palladium of the liberties of a republic. Our liberties have been shot to poop. It's the palladium of the liberties of a republic. Since it offers a strong moral check against the usurpation of arbitrary power of rulers and will, <clears throat> I missed my spot here, and will generally, even if these are successful in the first instance, enable the people to resist and triumph over them. Over who? The usurpation and arbitrary power of rulers. It's the militias, we're the moral check against the rulers getting out of line. They might attack us, but once we get organized, they have to fight all of us. They can't do that. But it's for us uh, to enable the people to resist and triumph over them. This is the Supreme Court, folks. This is the only precedent that they're allowed to discuss in a court of law. Even me, a dirt road idiot, can figure that out. And yet, though this truth may seem so clear and the importance of a well-regulated militia would seem so undeniable that it cannot be disguised that among the American people, there is a growing indifference to any system of militia discipline and a strong disposition from a sense of its burdens to be rid of all regulations. How is it practicable to keep the people duly armed without some organization? It's difficult to see. Listen to that clause once again. How is it practicable to keep the people duly armed. It's the government's responsibility to keep the people duly armed. And you can't do that with some type of organization. There is certainly no small danger 
that indifference may lead to disgust and disgust to contempt and thus gradually undermine all the protection intended by this clause of our National Bill of Rights. That's where we're at today, folks. Apathy, disgust, contempt. We've allowed it to undermine our protected liberties. And we're going to lose that moral check against rulers if we allow them to overstep our God-given, untouchable, undebatable rights. You cannot, if you are an elected official, let me repeat this again. This is the dirt road definition. I live on a dirt road. I got a house. Got one of those Southern houses that has a name. If it's in a bill of rights, once an elected official places hands on a Holy Bible to protect and defend that constitution, he forfeits the right to discuss anything in the Bill of Rights because he has sworn to defend it as written. He can't even propose an amendment to amend a Bill of Right. Got it? This is interesting. You get to the last the last paragraph of the Bill of Rights it says, it is plain, therefore, that it could not have been the intention of the framers of this amendment being the Bill of Rights as an abridgment of any of the powers granted under the Constitution, whether they are expressed or implied, direct or incidental, the 10th Amendment. If it's not designated to the federal government, it devolves either to the people or to the states or the people themselves. If it's in a Bill of Rights, it belongs to the people themselves and is off limits to both stages of government, federal or state, because a state constitution cannot violate the federal. So a state constitution can't have gun limits when the federal government guarantees it to all the people. Its sole design is to include any interpretation by which other powers should be assumed beyond those which are granted. Article 1, Section 8, this is what you can do. Article 9, this is what you cannot do. Article 10, this is what the states can and cannot do. The, de the Bill of Rights, this is what's off limits for anybody to do. All powers not delegated, not all powers not expressly delegated, that's a thing of intention of there, nor and not, pro, not prohibited are reserved. The attempts then, which have been made from time to time to force upon this language an abridging or restrictive influence are utterly unfounded. Any just rules of interpreting the words the way to interpret the words is to go to the dictionary and look it up. Or the sense of the instrument, stripped of the ingenious disguises in which they are clothed, they are neither more nor less than attempts to foist into the text the word expressly, to qualify what is general and obscure what is clear and defined. They make the sense of the passage bend to the wishes and prejudice of the interpreter and employ criticism to support a theory and not to guide it. They make the sense of the passage bend to the wishes and prejudice of the interpreter and employ criticism to support a theory and not to guide it. One should suppose if the history of the human mind did not furnish abundant proof to the contrary, that no reasonable man would contend for an interpretation founded neither in the love letter nor in the spirit of an instrument. I showed you both the letter and the spirit of the intention of the Second Amendment. 
where is controversy to end if we desert both the letter and the spirit? What is to become of constitutional governments if they are to rest not upon the plain import of their words, but upon conjectural enlargements and restrictions to suit the temporary passions and interests of the day? Don't let a good crisis go to work is where all of our legislation is motivated by today, and it's always to strip us of our unalienable rights. Let us never forget that our constitutional government are solemn instruments addressed to the common sense of the people. It has to, it has to be common sense to the individual dumbest, least educated person in society in order for it to be a constitutional law. It don't make sense to take away somebody's gun if you have to wait for the police to mobilize. Even the police, they can't act until after 911 is dialed. It's addressed to the common sense of the people and designed to fix. And this isn't fix the problem, it's to set in stone and perpetuate their rights and liberties. They are not to be frittered away to please the demagogues of the day. They are not to be and violated to gratify the ambition of political leaders. They speak in the same voice now and forever. They are of no man's private interpretation. They are ordained by the will of the people and can be changed only by the sovereign command of the people. I hope you understand what I just said. Do you know that this right here, they are of no man's private interpretation? Remember what I said about a right having to line up with the word of God? I'm going to show you how they just quoted a verse of scripture and you didn't even recognize it. Let's see. Second Peter chapter one, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Did I not show you the letter in the heart of the law that American law can't talk, contradicts the Bible, can't contradict the Bible, that our rights are unalienable and they're granted to us by the creator of the heavens and the earth, that no man is bigger than God. We place our hand on a holy Bible to show the earnestness of our pledge to protect the Constitution that we are to be accountable to God for our oath and our word, not just the people. We're accountable to the creator, the author of the book. Nobody cares. You tell me one person in America that has taught you this, what I taught you today, as simple as this, that's an elected official in the country. Name one, anyone, anywhere. There might be one out there, but I sure haven't met them, and I follow everything. Memorial Day. These men fought on April 19th of 1775. We have forgotten these men, but on this Memorial Day, I wanted to present this to you. On April 19th of 1775, General Gage, well, the night before, General Gage ordered approximately 800 British soldiers to march from the city of Boston to Concord, Massachusetts. The purpose of that excursion was to confiscate the arms of the citizens. They had intelligence that there were stockpiles of muskets, gunpowder, musket balls, bayonets, food, 
cannons. Cannons. 24 pounder cannons. They had a dozen of them. 24 pounder cannon was the biggest land gun of the era. These belong to the people. Our illustrious president not too long ago said that the American people in the revolution weren't allowed to own cannons. Well, I beg to differ. That's why they were going to Concord. Paul Revere and the ride, the British are coming, the British are coming. That wonderful poem that has very little history truth behind it. Anyway, when that column got to Lexington, the militia was formed and waiting. They were under orders from the government, from John Hancock, to not fire unless fired upon because God only honors a defensive war. But once blood is shed, you have permission to kill them all. We're, we're told today that nobody knows who fired the first shot. Well, the first page of this book has the portrait of the man who fired the first shot, and I have access to his guns. Also, there is a painting in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol showing that British officer aiming his pistol at the um, Captain John Parker of the Lexington Militia at almost point blank range. So Captain Parker, he knew who pulled the trigger because the gun was aiming at him and he testified in court. Anyway, so what we're going to do here is we're going to read the casualty list of the first American soldiers who were all militiamen, not regular army, who died in defense of their church, their families, and their own cities. They weren't fighting for Georgia. They weren't fighting for South Carolina. They weren't going to allow. This was to check the usurped power of the government. They dared to take on the greatest military might in the history of the world. And at the end of the day, the British officers that participated in that battle wrote in their diaries and their letters back to Parliament saying, we can't beat these people because these Christians will die on their feet before they will bow to tyranny and that we'll have to kill every day one of them. There's no way that we can beat these people. And folks, we had them outgunned. If we would have wanted to, we could have aimed those 12, 12 pounder can, 24 pounder cannons down the road at that marching column, filled them full of buckets of mini balls or musket balls, and in one volley, wiped out the whole column of 800 people if we were serious about starting a war. But we took them and hit them so that they couldn't get them. Anyway. So these are the first heroes of the American Revolution. The city of Acton killed Captain Isaac Davis, James Hayward, Abner Hosmer, wounded Luther Blanchard and Ezekiel Davis. Arlington killed Jason Russell, Jason Winship, Jabez Wyman, wounded Samuel Whitmore. Bedford killed Captain Jonathan Wilson, wounded Job Lane. Beverly, killed Reuben Kennison, wounded Nathaniel Cleves. William Dodge III, Samuel Woodbury. Balerica, wounded Timothy Blanchard, John Nichols. Brookline, killed Major Isaac Gardner. Cambridge, killed John Hicks. William Marcy, Moses Richardson, missing. Samuel Frost, Seth Russell, Concord, wounded Captain Nathan Barrett, Jonas Brown, Captain Charles Miles, Captain Charles Minot, Abel Prescott Jr., Charlestown killed Edward Barber, 12 years old, waving at the troops from his second story window. Chelmsford wounded 
Oliver Barron, Aaron Chamberlain, Danvers, Killed, Samuel Cook, Benjamin Dayland, Ebenezer Goldthwaite, Henry Jacobs, Pearlie Putnam, George Southwick, Jotham Webb, Wounded, Nathan Putnam, Dennison Wallace, Missing, Joseph Bell. All of these guys were killed in either the front yard or inside of one house. Dedham killed Elias Haven, wounded Israel Everett. Framington wounded Daniel Hemingway. Lexington killed John Brown, Samuel Hadley, Caleb Harrington, Jonathan Harrington, Jedediah Monroe, Robert Monroe, Isaac Muzzy, Jonas Parker, John Raymond, Nathaniel Wyman, wounded, Francis Brown, Joseph Comey, Prince Estabrook, the most famous soldier in the revolution. He served from first shot to last shot at Yorktown, and he was a black man, Prince Estabrook. Nathaniel Farmer, Ebenezer Monroe, Jedediah Monroe was killed later in the day. Solomon Pierce, John Robbins, John Tidd, Jason Winsup, Lincoln, wounded, Joshua Brooks, Lynn, killed, William Flint, Thomas Hadley, Abednego Ramsdale. His brothers were Shadrach and Meshach. Daniel Townsend, wounded, Joshua Felt, Timothy Monroe, missing, Josiah Breed. Medford, killed, William Polly, Henry Putnam, Needham, killed. Lieutenant John Bacon, Nathaniel Chamberlain, Amos Mills, Sergeant Elisha Mills, Jonathan Parker, wounded, Eleazar Kingsbury, and somebody named Tolman. Newton, wounded, Noah Wiswell, Roxbury, missing, Elijah Seaver, Salem, killed, Benjamin Pierce, Somerville, killed, James Miller, Sudbury killed, Josiah Haynes, Asahel Reed, wounded, Josiah Haynes, Josiah Haynes Jr. Stowe, wounded, Daniel Conant, Watertown, killed, Joseph Coolidge, Woburn, killed, Asahel Porter, Daniel Thompson, wounded, Jacob Bacon, Johnson, probably a slave, George Reed, Totals killed 49, wounded 41, missing five, total loss 95. Folks, those are the first heroes of America. They also listed the British. When you go down here and you scroll down in this book, This is the muster rolls of participating companies of American militia and Minutemen on the Battle of April 19, 1775, mostly from the archives of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but a few from other sources compiled by this guy. I have all those records. I just wrote a book called April 19th, From This Day, A Tale of Two Cannons, From This Day Will Be Marked the Liberty of the World. It'll be... Um, published hopefully by the end of this month. It goes into minute detail, all of these people and what they did on that day in their own words and their own records. This is a book called um, The Battle of Lexington, April 1975 by um, Frank Warren Coburn. It's a great book. It's a great work. It's very well um, done and very well footnoted, but there's other sources that he doesn't quote and doesn't use. Anyway, folks, hopefully you learned something here today. Our country's in deep doo-doo. If we don't stand, if we don't take a stand right now like these men did on April 19th and take on the British Army in their own front yards. And here's another thing about those militia companies. Every one of those militia companies were led by their pastor, or their head elder. When the pastor of the militia company was asked, of Lexington was asked by Governor John Hancock, if your people would fight, 
he responded, I have trained them for this very moment. I have trained them for this very moment. Has your pastor trained you how to stand for the militia? Has your pastor trained you how to protect your wives, your families, and the cities of your God because you are well-trained and armed? If he hasn't, he's violated his biblical duty as a pastor as well. If you want to know more, go to our website. It's called libertyman.online, libertyman.online. Feel free to go there and email me with anything that you would like to know about American history up until like the Civil War. I can give you the original document for everything that happened, just like we did here today. None of my private interpretation, just a simple reading of the documents. So until we get back to that point where all of us understand this kind of stuff, we're going to continue to go down a road that is not pleasant. So God bless. You're the best. Father, thank you for giving us this great country. Thank you for us being alive in this day and time to protect our liberties like these guys did on April 19th, that we can protect the liberties of our kids and our grandkids like they did. Hopefully we don't have to do it with arms. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Back here, the, the battle flag, you might not be able to read it, but this is the slogan of the American Revolution. Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. And this right here is the Wallace family crest. So anyway, God bless. You're the best and hope to see you next time.